from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Pustcast, episode 19, recorded on January 4th, 2023. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is the famous Sarah Dong. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So on to the literature, shall we? All right, I guess the first one is mine. So we're going to start with our viral. And remember to listen to This Week in Virology clinical updates for timely viral-related information, um, but also the other uh, deep dive twivs. But I will start off with what I think is a really great and uh, timely article, Burden of Post-Infectious Symptoms After Acute Dengue, Vietnam, published in Emerging Infectious Diseases. Um, was was everyone thinking I was going to say COVID? <laughs> While the symptoms of acute dengue are generally understood to resolve after one to two weeks, the potential for persistent or delayed symptoms has received increasing attention in recent years. Wonder why. In addition to a nice review of some literature such as the Cuba study and a study out of Singapore, here the authors assess predominantly pediatric patients in Vietnam with dengue and other febrile illness three months after acute illness. Among dengue patients, 47% reported one or more post-acute symptoms, most resolved by three months, but alopecia, right? That's your hair falling out and vision problems often persisted. Um, now, I used to have a full head of hair myself, <laughs> and now after having dengue infections with the second resulting in hospitalization, my barber suggests I may be getting a little thin on top. Coincidence? <laughs> Remember, these are children with alopecia, so this could be devastating as we see with PASC alopecia over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and then I picked a viral paper uh, from OFID, Marubivir for CMV treatment in the real world, not a silver bullet. Uh, so this is actually a pretty quick read, but they talk a little bit about two transplant recipients who had breakthrough CMV infection while receiving Marivivir, which is one of the newer CMV drugs. And so just as a quick overview, the first patient was a lung transplant recipient who was a high-risk CMV seer status going into their transplant and ultimately developed Marivivir resistant CMV. Um, and was later found to have a specific UL97H411Y mutation um, and was treated with foscarnet and ultimately transitioned to latermavir. And then the second patient was a 37-year-old with a history of HIV and primary HLH who underwent a haploidentical stem cell transplant um, that was later complicated by CMV DNAmia. And, you know, there's, it's really just these two cases, but I think it is helpful to hear about relapse and breakthrough infection and development of resistance with this newer drug, because most of what we know are from the clinical trial. And uh, this topic actually came up clinically for me, so I was uh, kind of overlapped with something that I had questions about. But I think, you know, we're still learning more about what do we do for management in these sort of complicated CMV infections for transplant patients. Okay. And moving on to bacterial, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. Um, I, I like this article so much, I almost put it in twice. <laughs> so, the article, a 24-week all-oral regimen for rifampin-resistant tuberculosis, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so here the investigators conducted an open label, phase 2-3, that's become the big thing, multi-center randomized controlled non-inferiority trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of three 24-week all-oral regimens for the treatment of rifampin-resistant tuberculosis. So patients in Belarus, South Africa, and Uzbekistan who were 15 years of age or older and had rifampin-resistant pulmonary tuberculosis were enrolled. Um, in stage two of the trial, a 24-week regimen of betaquiline, pretominid, linazolid, and moxifloxacin um, were compared with a nine to 20 month standard care regimen. The primary outcome was an unfavorable status, 
positive death, treatment failure, treatment discontinuation, loss to follow-up, or recurrence of tuberculosis, all unfavorable. At 72 weeks after randomization, they found that in patients with rifampin-resistant pulmonary tuberculosis, a 24-week all-oral regimen was non-inferior to the accepted standard of care treatment and actually had a better safety profile. Pretty exciting. You snagged that one before I could get to it. <laughs> um, I have a paper from JPIS, the Journal of the Pediatric ID Society, Beta-Lactam Allergy Association with Surgical Site Infections in Pediatric Procedures, a matched cohort study. So this was a retrospective cohort study that looked at about 2,000 procedures performed in pediatric patients with and without beta-lactam allergy. And, you know, they all require, these were included because they required antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, about 9% or 1,000 of the approximately 11,000 procedures that they looked at had a reported beta-lactam allergy. And surgical site infections were present at similar rates in those who had a beta-lactam allergy listed versus without. So it was 1.8 versus 1.9%. Um, interestingly, there was no increase in surgical site infections and procedures with reported beta-lactam allergies, which is different from the adult studies um, where it's been reported that patients have up to a 50% increased risk if you have a penicillin allergy label. So I think that, um, you know, it's kind of interesting that it's different, but I also wonder, you know, a lot of these patients in the study actually ended up still getting beta-lactam antibiotics for prophylaxis, even with their um, sort of listed allergies. So maybe that's why there wasn't as much of an increased risk, but um, kind of a cool study and specifically looking at pediatric patients, which was nice. All right. The article, The Effect of Macrolides on Mortality in Bacteremic Pneumococcal Pneumonia, a Retrospective Nationwide Cohort Study, Israel, 2009 through 2017, was published in CID. Now, I mean, actually, just sort of spoiler alert, I was surprised by this outcome, right? I thought I, thought I sort of knew, you know, what this would lead to. So, um, you know, this goes along with the lines of, of science will surprise you and break your heart. <laughs> Here, the investigators are looking at a historical cohort of over 2,000 patients identified with pneumococcal pneumonia with bacteremia and report that receiving macrolide therapy with azithromycin or roxy, what, roxithromycin was associated with an increased risk of survival. So decreased odds for mortality by 45%. Um, this effect was not seen for co-administration of quinolones. And the authors suggest that um, there's some sort of anti-inflammatory magical effect of the macrolides, such as inhibition of pneumolysin, rather than their antibacterial properties, an effect not shared with quinolones. Um, I do know some of our colleagues are working on modifying macrolides and other antibiotics to remove the antimicrobial properties and just retain the immune modulating properties. So that would be ideal for clarifying the mechanism, also for using it in this role without driving any um, antimicrobial resistance problems. Um, I also would love a prospective trial, right? This is a retrospective, because I wonder if perhaps this is just a marker for people following guidance on pneumonia treatment. Um, why were those other folks not getting macrolides when that's in the guidelines? Um, I will say in my many years of training and practice, I, I've only met one provider who did not start with atypical coverage with macrolides or a quinolone, and that was an older infectious disease physician who uh, told me that we did not have Legionella in the tri-state area, and thus he did not test for it or treat for it. <laughs> um, my next paper is from JAMA Network Open, Association of Linnae's Lid with Risk of Serotonin Syndrome in Patients Receiving Antidepressants. And yes, we have covered this topic on prior episodes, uh, but I'm pretty pro linazolid and I like to include these. So this is another look at the incidence of serotonin syndrome in patients who specifically are receiving oral linazolid with antidepressants. So it's population-based retrospective cohort study. So they looked at database info from outpatients age 65 years or older in Ontario, um, and then found those who were prescribed oral linazolid and had follow-up for at least a month. And the primary outcome was clinically significant serotonin syndrome requiring a clinic, emergency room, or hospital visit. 
And the diagnosis was ultimately based on physician diagnosis, Sternbach criteria, or Hunter serotonin toxicity criteria within 30 days of starting treatment. They had about 11,000 patients who were prescribed linazolid with 215 of those, so about a fifth, who were also taking antidepressants. And they included um, several different classes. About half of the antidepressants that were being prescribed were SSRIs, just for some context. Serotonin syndrome occurred in less than 0.5% of patients. And the adjusted risk, although technically lower in the antidepressant group, was not clinically significant. I was looking through the the mean duration of linazolid treatment was somewhere around 10 to 11 days in both the antidepressant and no antidepressant group for those who are wondering how long they were on the linazolid. So more data from a large observational data set that perhaps we may exaggerate the risk of serotonin syndrome with linazolid and, you know, in combination with other medications when it's actually safe. I actually think it was also quite nice that these ended up being older patients, um, specifically who I think are those that maybe we worry more so about these interactions than in other patients, but, um, I will keep adding these as they come out. So (laughs) if people have uh, linazolid interaction papers, they can send them to me and I will include them. All right. Yes, I I think the clinic, well, the clinical pharmacists are well aware that I consider this uh, linazolid triggering serotonin syndrome to be a more of a myth than a reality. So sometimes it just makes people forego a really good (laughs) option with linazolid. I think I think hopefully that's what the science that we're sharing is uh, letting people yeah. know. Um, yes, don't don't use an inferior, more toxic therapy when you can safely use linazolid. Yeah. All right, the article association of repeated blood cultures with mortality in adult patients with gram-negative bacilli bacteremia, a systematic review and meta-analysis. This reminded me of Mark Chrislip's strong feelings on this topic. Um, I don't know if you're if you're aware of those or if you are a a Puscast listener, uh, Sarah. But uh, yeah. uh, let, let me <laughs> let me just go right. I'm going to quote them: performing repeat blood cultures after an initial positive culture, i.e., follow up blood cultures in patients with Gram negative bacilli bacteremia, re- remains controversial or is controversial. So they aim to address this issue with this publication. Just to make Mark even happier, they conducted a systematic review and random effects meta-analysis and piled the cow pies to an adequate height to create gold. They identified nine eligible retrospective studies. Oh, it's getting better. In total, 7,778 hospitalized patients with gram-negative um, bacilli bacteremia were included. Um, the studies were clinically heterogeneous, and all the studies were rated as having a critical risk of bias. The risk of bias was deemed severe, particularly co-found, confounders, participant selection, intervention classification, and missing data. So I think they just suggested we stop here, but no, they continue. <laughs> all right, crummy data, but let's see what the crummy data has to say. Now, here it gets interesting. Perhaps if one is still going to spend time reading this article to support whatever practice bias they bring to this, they go on to say the median mortality rate um, was 9% in the follow-up blood culture group and 11% in the no follow-up blood culture group. Looks like a big overlap there. We've got a range of three to 15%, a range of three to 50%. So not really impressing considering we were told for starters that the papers selected were all critically flawed. But then we read that when they do the random effects model meta analysis, this suggests that follow-up blood cultures could be associated with a lower mortality risk. So Sarah, are you convinced of what? I'm not sure. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know that I'm totally compelled there. Um, Well, I think this next one too will be a good one for us to talk about. And hopefully, I think um, we've tried to cover similar papers like this before. Um, so in OFID, there is an article about evaluating the predictive value of surgical resected proximal bone margins in diabetic foot osteomyelitis with clinical outcomes at one year. So for background, there have been mixed results on the outcomes when patients have histopath presence of osteomyelitis at the proximal margins. 
And so this was a single center retrospective study that looked at patient records of those who had limb sparing below the ankle amputations from 2016 to 2019. So they based some of this on ICD and CPT codes. And then they manually screened to confirm a diagnosis of diabetes and whether there was a confirmed PATH report from histo, you know, specifically with histopathology, and then only included first encounters of diabetic foot osteo. So once they whittled all those down, there were 92 patients, and 57 of the 92 patients, or 62%, had pathology confirmed negative margins. So those with negative margins required less frequent subsequent amputations at that same site within 12 months compared to those with positive margins. So it was 86% versus 66% with a p-value of 0.003. The authors also found that the shorter antibiotic duration um, was present in those who had negative margins. So it was 18 days of antibiotics in those with negative margins versus 30 if they had positive margins. And then the patients who had negative margins also had lower rates of readmission at 12 months. So 26% versus 51%. Um, the patients have pretty similar baseline demographics and A1Cs and most of their lab values like CRP and ESR. The only thing that was noted is the tobacco history was uh, technically significant um, and more common in the group with positive margins, but it didn't really pan out in the multivariable analysis. And sort of the last thing that they started to take a look at is the micro perspective and found that Staph aureus was more commonly uh, noted in the individuals of positive margin, so 51 versus 30% with a p-value of 0.017. But I will give the caveat that I don't, it seems like the operative cultures were not necessarily documented to be directly from the proximal margin, which I think means that they could have been included regardless of sort of where they were from. And so the general conclusions were that negative proximal bone margins on a histopath were associated with lower frequency of further amputations within 12 months, shorter courses of antibiotics, and lower rates of readmissions for surgical site complications. I wanted to take a pause to note that this was still a two-thirds or 66% rate of amputation, even if you had negative margins which is very high. And I also thought it was a little bit interesting that the patients with negative margins still seem to get about three weeks of antibiotics, which I think probably is longer than I would have expected. I feel like generally if they have negative margins and amputation, many people will truncate their course shorter than that, but not at least in this study. Um, and then I, you know, I think the issue that is present in practice and, uh, what makes it so hard to study this is that pathology is not always or uniformly done. You have scenarios where people have serial debridements. Um, and then there's always the issue of vascular perfusion and other sort of functional issues that impact how these patients do afterwards. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know how to sort of use this for, for my future patients. <laughs> I don't know what you think, uh, Daniel, but just a little bit surprised that so many patients ultimately had amputation even with negative margins, which makes me think that that's what they really needed at the end of the day. But. Yeah, no, I I was, um, you know, the the more I learn about um, osteomyelitis and amputations and how to deal with margins and how to deal with the cultures, um, the, the less confident I am that we really understand what yeah. is pretty significant um, part of the practice of an infectious disease physician. So, I mean, a couple things. One is, yeah, I was shocked, right? Negative margins, the majority of people are still coming back to get more chopped off within a year. Mm -hmm. um, that th Within 12 months, 66% versus 86. So yeah, give me a p-value, but I'm still looking at both numbers and saying, I'm not happy with either. The majority of the time when we say we've removed all that infected bone, they're coming back to get more removed. You know, and then I'm still not sure about this. You know, you, you take a small sample. You're not taking the whole end of the residual bone. You're just, you know, so are you missing? Like how how sensitive? Um, seemingly not so sensitive. You're leaving behind infection if 66% are going to come back or is it just the disease process that people who get osteo are likely to get it again within such a short window? Yeah. Um, 
So that that bothers me. The other I thought was interesting. So they talk about readmission at 12 months, 26% versus 51. But I thought 66% were getting amputations. Aren't you getting admitted for those amputations? Where are they doing those amputations? <laughs> I'm thinking 66% are back in the hospital to get that next amputation. So yeah, um, yeah I was really, it made me really um, ask the question of, you know, what is the appropriate standard of care for, um, for diabetic foot osteomyelitis? What should we be doing? 66%, 86%. These are horrible outcomes. Should everybody be getting long-term? Um, should we be doing more aggressive um, amputations? So I really feel like this is a, a huge area where we need more data and practice improvement. Yeah. I need to read more about how people have looked at sort of com comparing patients that had their amputations deferred. Because I feel like that's often what happens is you're following along with a patient and you sort of think you're in an okay place and you revisit it and revisit it and ultimately get the amputation. And then they, I feel like a lot of times the patients feel so much better. <laughs> and then in retrospect, they're like, oh, maybe we should have just done it when we first had the conversation. Um, yeah, I don't know what the right thing to do is. It always feels so case by case basis instead of um, having a better, uh, like formal sort of pathway for what you can apply to more majority of people. Yeah, I'm also I'm also not sure I fully understand. Like, okay, acute osteomyelitis, residual in the margin. Okay, we know what to do there, maybe. Um, but chronic osteomyelitis, because we see those people come back with recurrence and mm -hmm. more amputations. And so, what's you know, yeah, mm -hmm. I we need to know more. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, now this this week I wore my fungal bow tie. For those of you <laughs> Very nice. on YouTube. This is, my hair. And you can flip it over. This side, it's bright and red. The other side's mostly wow. green. So, yeah, I wear it twice in the same week if I travel. Uh, but moving into the fungal section, uh, the article Burden of Serious Fungal Infections in India was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Uh, here, the authors conducted a systematic review of the literature on the PubMed, I like they call it the PubMed, on the Embase and Web of Science databases. Their searches yielded 2,900 papers, and then 434 papers with incidence, prevalence, proportion data were ultimately analyzed. A, analyzed. a Herculean task, or here should I say a task worthy of Bhima of the Pandavas. Based on this analysis, they suggest that an estimated 57,251,328 of the over 1 billion people in India, so about 4%, uh, suffer from a serious fungal disease. It's 1 in 25. That seems a little high. Um, the prevalence in millions of recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, uh, they have it 24.3 million. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, 2 million. Tinea capitis, 25 million in school age children. Severe asthma with fungal sensitization, over a million. Chronic pulmonary asp aspergillosis, 1.74 million. Chronic fungal rhinosinusitis, 1.52. The annual incidence rates of pneumocystis is over 58,000. Invasive aspergillosis, quarter million and mucor mycosis, 195,000, esophageal candidiasis and HIV, over a quarter million, candidemia, almost 200,000, fungal keratitis, over a million, cryptococcal meningitis, 11,500. Um, there also were cases of histo, mycosis mycetoma, and chromoblastomycosis, but less frequently. So um, as disturbing as the, the implication in the article is itself, it's very interesting, and I'll share just a few things that I, I learned. Um, Hindu scripture written between 1500 and 500 before the Common Era mentions mycetoma, or pada valmikam, or antel foot in the Indian population, and... A little bit of trivia for, I don't know when this will come up, but the first case of histoplasmosis was reported in Calcutta in 1954. Um, they also mentioned the COVID-19 association with mucor mycosis in the context of prolonged high-dose steroids and unnecessary antibiotics. All right. Parasitic. Be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Um, and we have an article that I don't know, is it about ectoparasites or bacteria? The article Bartonella 
Quintana, transmitted by head lice, an outbreak of trench fever in Senegal, was published in CID. Well, it's in this section, so we must be ectoparasites. Now, louse-borne trench fever caused by Bartonella Quintana is a neglected public health concern known to be transmitted from body louse feces via scratching. No viable B. Quintana has ever been isolated from head lice before today. In Senegal, they used cultures as well as molecular and genomic approaches to document an outbreak of trench fever or Quintana, the five-day recurrent fever, associated with head lice in the village of Nidiap. Head lice and blood samples were collected from febrile patients between November 2010 and April 2015. A total of over 2,000 blood samples were collected during the period um, from 2010 to 2013 B. Quintana DNA was detected by PCR in 0.25%. In 2014, uh, 228 blood samples were collected, um, along with 161 head lice from five individuals. B. Quintana DNA was detected in 4.4% of the blood samples and in lice specimens collected from febrile patients and non-febrile patients. Two B. Quintana strains were isolated from blood and head lice from two different patients. This is where we come to the punch. Genomic sequence analysis showed 99 to 98% overall similarity between both strains. The authors suggested that the presence of live B. Quintana in head lice and the genetic identity of strains from patients' blood and head lice during a localized outbreak in Senegal supports the evidence of head lice vectoral capacity. All right. So I've got a few more in uh, the parasitic section, and then I think uh, Sarah's got a bunch in miscellaneous. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The article, Balamuthia mandrillaris granulomatosis amoebic encephalitis, the first African experience, was published in JPIDS. Here, the authors report the first case of Balamuthia mandrillaris granulomatous amoebic encephalitis definitively acquired in Africa. So they report that their case emphasizes initial nonspecific dermatological features, delays in confirmation of the diagnosis, difficulties assessing recommended medication, and uncertainty about optimal treatment of a disease with a frequently fatal outcome. All right. Dogs and parasites. What could be more interesting to me? The article, Detecting Leishmania in Dogs, a Hierarchical Modeling Approach to Investigate the Performance of Parasitological and QPCR-Based Diagnostic Procedures, was published in PLOS, Neglected Tropical Disease. For background, dogs can be reservoir hosts of Leishmania. Here, the investigators used parasitological and molecular testing to study 294 field sample dogs from central Brazil. While molecular testing was only about 49 to 53% sensitive, specificity was high, 95 to 96%, only when very stringent criteria were used to detect and handle possible sample contamination. Uh, perhaps the most important important was just to remind people of the role of dogs in Leishmania transmission in many parts of the world. Um, I will tell a little, I think it's an interesting anecdote, <laughs> maybe it's Dixon-esque, but um, you know, I go down to Panama periodically and we go out to these, to these remote villages on these islands, peninsulas. And uh, I was talking, you know, it was end of the day, we were chatting about one of the villages that really was seeing a significant number of Leishmania um, cases. And we were looking at some pictures. And one of the pictures that I was shown was of this dog with this um, lesion, this ulcerative lesion on his snout. Well, not only was I concerned for the poor dog, but it suddenly occurred to me that I may have an insight into why they were seeing so much Leishmania in this village. So um, the dog was treated, the dog was cured, and coincident with that, we had a drop in cases. Interesting. Um, well, I will kick off our miscellaneous section. I do have a couple in here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is I absolutely love the BMJ Christmas articles. Uh, if people don't know, every 
uh, sort of December-ish, they release several kind of fun articles, and there's always some really good gold things to read through. Uh, and so this year, they had one that was called Misspelling of Antimicrobials by Healthcare Professionals. So I encourage you to check this out for a quick read if you want to take a laugh. They have a little chart that's built in um, showing some commonly misspelled antimicrobials, and they do a little sort of translation or note on the side. And so my particular favorite was uh, spelling Astrianam as Astria man. And their little comment next to it was Astrianam by day, Astria man by night. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Yeah, that is a pet peeve of mine, particularly when ID docs misspell those. (laughs) Oh, it's so great. You can just picture people typing in. These folks be like, man, why can't I find like Erdipenum or whatever else? <laughs> it's great. All right. The article, A Primer on Home Infusion Administration Methods, was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. And I will suggest it should be required reading for all providers, but particularly those in the field of infectious diseases. I want to point out that home and specialty infusion is a $19 billion industry serving over $3.2 million patients each year and is an effective um, and efficient way to provide many therapies directly in a patient's home nursing home, outpatient clinic, avoiding hospitalization. Therapies include, but are not limited to, intravenous administration of various antimicrobials, uh, total parental nutrition, patient-controlled analgesia, ionotropes, home hydration, immunoglobulins, immunomodulating agents. And this article even has some great photos. I totally second and third this. I I think this paper is so, so great, especially when you're seeing patients in clinic and um, want to have a better understanding with some of the photos that are in there. Um, but my next one is from Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, How to use biomarkers of infection or sepsis at the bedside, a guide for clinicians. Uh, I mentioned this because I feel like this is also a really good resource if you're having a conversation with someone and um, or a learner and you want to give them this paper. I took one of the quotes from their introduction. In daily bedside practice for the diagnosis and management of sepsis, as well as for antibiotic stewardship, clinicians combine data from different sources that result from the intersection of three vectors, systemic manifestations, organ dysfunction, and microbiological documentation. And they go on to talk about biomarkers and describe them as prognostic, predictive, or theranostic, um, with this last one meaning ability to identify a particular patient that could benefit from a specific therapy, which is kind of the concept of precision medicine. And so I think most of the people who probably listen to podcasts are quite familiar with pathogen-specific biomarkers, but the authors have a really nice summary of host-response biomarkers with a focus on procalcitonin and CRP. And in particular, there's a nice chart that's uh, table two that looks at the timing of these biomarkers, possible factors that can have an effect on them, such as how procalcitonin can be influenced by renal replacement therapy and GFR. Um, And then one of the figures, which is figure two, there's a user guide that talks a little bit about sort of a general guideline and recommends after you do your workup, for example, at the end of this algorithm, stopping antibiotics in patients who've had clinical improvement, and uh, they suggested five days of antibiotics with a procalcitonin decrease of 80 to 90% and or CRP decrease by 50% versus seven days, regardless of biomarkers. Um, I think to summarize, the take-homes are things that I bet most of us say and explain every day during our consult service. Um, that serial trends are more useful than a single value. I feel like I should have a little thing on my forehead that says that. Um, And to really never use biomarkers as a standalone test, specifically I'm thinking about Procal and CRP, um, that you really have to interpret it in conjunction with a clinical evaluation and not just how your patient is doing right at that moment, but the trend of how they've been doing. Anyways, that's my soapbox. I will will step down now. (laughs) All right. The article, An Implementation Roadmap for Establishing Remote Infectious Disease Specialist Support for Consultation and Antibiotic Stewardship in Resource-Limited Settings, was recently published in OFID. 
one thing about infectious disease is that it is a very cognitive specialty, so does open itself up to remote consultations. Uh, for background, as Sarah is keen to always share, ID expertation, expertise clearly adds value, reduces costs, reduces hospital stays, reduces risk of death and bad outcomes, and clearly helps with the oncoming zombie antimicrobial resistance apocalypse. But on-site ID specialists are absent from at least a quarter of U.S. hospitals and virtually all nursing homes. Furthermore, 80% of U.S. counties have zero ID physicians. So what about telehealth consultations? When telehealth has been used for remote ID physician consultation, patient outcomes have been comparable to in-person consultation. Um, we have also seen that remote ID physician consultation has been associated with fewer hospital transfers, shorter lengths of stay. Telehealth can also be used to support local antibiotic stewardship activities remotely, independent of direct patient care. So this approach can reduce antibiotic use, minimize antibiotic-related adverse events, and decrease costs. I wonder if any of those administrators are listening and they're going to offer some lucrative remote job. But in this paper, the authors outline how a telehealth program can be implemented to provide remote ID specialist support for patient consultation and or antibiotic stewardship. Really interesting stuff. And as Sarah discussed in one of her recent Febrile podcasts, Febrile 65, Match Update and YID, infectious disease really shines when one moves into value rather than procedure-based care. Ultimately, I anticipate market forces making infectious disease a specialty in demand as the focus is on better outcomes and not just doing stuff. <laughs> Love it. Um, well, I will change gears a little bit. Uh, I did pull another paper. This one is also from OFID. It's entitled Perceptions and Reality of Antimicrobial Prescribing During the Transition to Comfort Measures Only. Uh, we call it CMO at an academic medical center. And so this article used a multidisciplinary survey that focused on antibiotic prescribing during this transition, as well as uh, coupled this with a retrospective chart review to examine those who received antimicrobials in the 48 hours um, prior to transitioning to CMO. And so in the survey, they found that 40%, give or take, of respondents indicated that they sometimes or often continue antibiotics during the transition, citing typically patient and or family preference and symptom palliation as common factors. And uh, I will just also pull out a note that of about 550 charts that reviewed were reviewed, about a quarter of the patients were alive at 48 hours after the CMO order, and about 14% of those remained on antibiotics. So I think this is a very relevant topic that certainly comes up clinically, and I think digging into that desire to palliate symptoms in this setting is very interesting. You know, what is the true risk-benefit of antibiotics at the end of life? And for example, in this study, they found that the survey respondents felt that the antibiotics probably would be most helpful if someone has fever or dysuria, but perhaps less helpful with cough and dyspnea. So there's not much evidence that the approach of continuing antibiotics for symptom relief actually helps, um, but I think it's probably driven by a combination of sort of heterogeneous patients that have been looked at at the end of life and the fact that it may just be really difficult to tell if they have a bacterial infection. And there's so many factors that go into it, but at least the survey and chart review give some insight into what people were thinking. And I think I would have picked this article anyways, because I think this topic is very interesting. But I do have to say that I would give a shout out to the authors who I know from fellowship and who are near nearby me. Okay. All right. And I, I guess I'm going to close this out with the article, Can the Future of ID Escape the Inertial Dogma of Its Past? The Exemplars of Shorter is Better and Oral is the New IV, published in OFID. So let me start by sharing the abstract because it is a work of art. Like all fields of medicine, infectious disease is rife with dogma that underpins much clinical practice. 
Here we discuss two specific examples of historical practice that have been overturned recently by numerous prospective studies, traditional durations of antimicrobial therapy, and the necessity of intravenous IV-only therapy for specific infectious syndromes. These dogmas are based on uncontrolled case series from greater than 50 years ago, amplified by the opinions of eminent experts. Conversely, more than 120 modern randomized control trials have established that shorter durations of therapy are equally effective for many infections. Furthermore, 21 concordant randomized control trials have demonstrated that oral antibiotic therapy is at least as effective as IV-only therapy for osteomyelitis, bacteremia, and endocarditis. Nevertheless, practitioners in many clinical settings remain refractory to adopting these, dare I say, evidence-based changes. Um, I can imagine this being spoken at a rally, followed by chanting, it is time for infectious disease to move beyond its history of eminent opinion-based medicine and truly into the era of evidence-based medicine. Okay, still working on the right <laughs> chant. A couple of great lines. <laughs> In 321, common era Constantine the Great decreed that there would be seven days in a week. This is the actual historical basis for therapeutic durations as multiples of seven days. We have described these durations as Constantine units to underscore the absurdity of using the decree of an ancient Roman emperor as an evidentiary basis for modern therapy. The second line of evidence was based on the number of metacarpal bones that evolved in the hominid hand. <laughs> which has resulted in five to 10 day durations. This latter line of evidence has led one or more of us to speculate that the world might be a better place with diminished antimicrobial resistance if we had instead evolved as three toed sloths. <laughs> I, I do like how you kind of already know who some or most of the authors are just by the intro <laughs> and the abstract. Um, but yeah, quite, quite good. Um, well, that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease podcast at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv forward slash podcast. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions. Send them to podcast at microbe.tv and consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong, at Febrile Podcast, or at febrilepodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com, on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts this week in parasitism and this week in virology clinical updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you and dictation and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious.